John Hagee Ministries has been reaching out to millions of people worldwide every week, delivering all the gospel to all the world and to all generations. Please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Turn your Bibles to Exodus, the 14th chapter, verses 10 and following. As we continue the sermon series, Promise, Problem, Provision, with this third sermon, Solving Your Problem. How many of you have ever had a problem? Let me see your hand. How many of you are going through a problem? You want to hear this message and the one next Sunday. The Jewish people had been slaves in Egypt for 430 years. They had been beaten, starved, dehumanized. Their sons had been drowned in the Red Sea as a form of population control because Pharaoh was afraid they would become too numerous and would overthrow them. By an awesome demonstration of God's power of 10 plagues, where God crushed the economy of Egypt where one dead person was in most homes in Egypt because the firstborn was killed. Moses led them out of Egypt on that Passover day to break into the sunshine of freedom after 430 years of slavery. They left Egypt with ox carts full of gold and silver and fine fabrics. In less than a week, they were standing at the edge of the bitter water of Merah. They were attacking Moses saying, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Didn't we tell you that this would happen? Every person in this audience and thousands more watching by television across the nation and around the world are making decisions about slavery and freedom every day. When America was born, our forefathers met in Philadelphia and they chose freedom over slavery to King George III. Patrick Henry stood and shouted to the assembly, give me liberty or give me death. Those words have penetrated the minds and hearts of our generation from that day until this one. Today, America is rejecting freedom for political slavery. We are swiftly becoming a socialist nation, a godless nation, where the younger generation called millennials are demanding everything for free from a diminishing population of older people who are willing to work. The message to millennials from the word of God today is, there is no free lunch, go to work. The government that gives you everything can take everything. The government that gives you nothing didn't give you anything before they took it away from someone else. According to the Wall Street Journal, 
There are 94,708,000 Americans not working. 94 million plus Americans not working. Most of them are able-bodied and don't care to work because what they get from the federal government beats what they feel like they can make by the sweat of their brow. Nothing in your life will work until you do. God worked six days in the book of Genesis. The Ten Commandments, six days you shall work. That's still the law of God. That means some of you need to slow down and the rest of you need to pick up the pace. <laughs> Freedom isn't free. Freedom is not free. We're here today because my father's generation slugged it out through the Great Depression. They recovered from the disaster of Pearl Harbor and they beat the Nazis and the Axis power in four years. It didn't take them 10 years and they gave it all back in six months. We're not goose-stepping today because someone paid the price for our political freedom. I have stood on Omaha Beach and walked the sands of that beach and the distance that over 10,000 young men died on in one day for our freedom. I remember Iwo Jima. I remember Guadalcanal. I remember Korea. We have fought in the swamps of Vietnam, the sands of the Middle East. May God bless America and may God bless the military personnel who have given us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our spiritual freedom is not free. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, bled and died on a blood-soaked cross at Calvary to liberate you from the powers and principalities of darkness. If you don't know Jesus Christ, St. Paul says you are a slave to sin and to Satan. Some of you are slaves to addictive habits. Some of you in this room, some of you watching by television, drugs, alcohol, pornography. Some of you are slaves to uncontrollable emotions, anger, bitterness, resentment, hatred, rejection, depression, a tormenting mindset. Our government is being controlled by a cadre of billionaires who are using their financial power to control America's political process and thereby controlling the America's future. They are called elitist and they do not have your interest at heart. How can this be stopped? How can we the people bring freedom back to America? The answer is get up and go vote and vote the Bible. Stop sending the same cadre back to Washington. <laughs> Said a little plainer, vote to rebuild our military. Vote to secure our borders. Vote for a godly Supreme Court. Wake up America. Freedom is not free. We must unite and speak out for the freedoms that we desire to have. Now, more than ever before, give the Lord praise in the house of God. <laughs> Read the text from Exodus, the 14th chapter and 10th verse. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone? that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Listen, for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. When God wipes your enemies out, you will never see them again. That, my friend, is solving the problem. Give the Lord praise in the house. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this day. 
Thank you for your word. Thank you for this people. We have problems, but we have a problem solving God. We have a light, which is the word of God. Let us learn to obey it and walk in the path of righteousness to receive the eternal abundance that God gives the righteous. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's children said amen. amen. You may be seated. Let's quickly review the substance of the last two sermons, which are these 10 points. One, 10 ways to shorten your stay in the problem. How many of you would like to get out of your problem as soon as possible? You do not want to make a career out of it. The children of Israel were in the problem for 40 years, the wilderness. Jesus was in the problem for 40 days. The difference is that the children of Israel, every time God tried to show them the way out of the problem, they rebelled, they whined, they complained, they bellyached. Were there not enough graves in Egypt? And God let them take another lap around Mount Sinai. And they went around and around and around until 40 years later, God only allowed the young people to go into the land. When Jesus went into the wilderness, he was there 40 days. He was there 40 days because every time Satan tempted him, he said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He went to the word of God. He hammered the prince of darkness by the principles of the word of God. If you will apply the word of God, you will go straight through the problem and not make a career of the problem. Give the Lord praise in the house. Now, here are the 10 ways to shorten your stay in the problem. These are in the first two sermons. One, take responsibility for your actions. Response able. You are able to make a response, intelligent response, to the crisis in which you find yourself. Churchill said, responsibility is the key to greatness. And that's true. Two, be willing to work for what you want. I've already addressed that. Three, don't waste time fighting what you cannot change. There are things that happen in your life that you're worrying about it, you're grinding your teeth about it, complaining about it, will not change. It happened 10 years ago, 10 months ago. You can't change it. Move on. Move on. Just go on. Press through it. Four, when you're wrong, admit it and take responsibility for being wrong. I know that's a difficult thing to do. One man said, I thought I was wrong once, but I just thought I was wrong. <laughs> Five, do not nurse a grudge. Forgive immediately and forgive totally. Not to forgive another person puts the key to the cell that you're living in, in a prison whose bars are made of emotion. And you're going to be in that cell until you forgive that person because that person is your warden until you forgive them. Forgiveness is not for them, it's for you. Forgiveness liberates you, do it. Six, shorten your time in the problem by being generous to those who need help. Listen, how you respond to someone in their time of need is going to determine how God responds to you the next time you get in a need. Because the law of God is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Because what you do to others, God is going to do to you. Ooh, that'll preach. I mean, just stay with that a while. Seven, let your mouth be ruled by the law of kindness. If you can't say something kind, just shut up. It's an amazing thing. You don't have to comment about everything. Give your jaws a rest. To the religious, I say, don't judge someone because they sin differently from you. Ooh, that'll preach all by itself. Eight, 
Refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands you a raw deal. How many of you have ever gotten a raw deal? About half of you are alive in here. <laughs> and here's the phrase, get over it. Say it, get over it. Nine, learn to listen. Learn to listen to God. Learn to listen to your spouse. Learn to listen to your children. I looked at those two words the other day, listen and silent. There are two words spelled with exactly the same letters, just in a different configuration. What they have to do with listening. When you're listening to your spouse and you're really listening, you're not waiting until she takes a breath so you can jump in with your argument. You're listening. It takes more discipline to listen than it does to talk. Can I get a witness here? <laughs> Ten. Ten, be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Those are what we covered in the first two sermons. Now, we continue today with this thought, how you see the problem is the problem. Say that with me. How you see the problem is the problem. A young man came home from college wearing the latest clothes, and his father met him at the, on the front porch and said, Son, you look like a fool. At that exact moment, Miss Jones was walking down the sidewalk and she saw Joe and said, hi, Joe, it's nice to see you. You're looking more like your father every day. <laughs> and the boy said, yeah, my dad was just telling me that. <laughs> the point I'm making, two people can have two different points of view and neither one of them are wrong, they're just different. Believe me, when you get older, the younger crowd is going to have ideas you don't like. I'll move right along. <laughs> How you see the problem is the problem. When Matthew, Tina, and Sandy were two, three, four, five, right in those ages, Don and I had a Marine Corps drill down where we carried the children to and from the car to the church uh, every time we went to the church or anywhere else. I carried the three children. I put Matthew over here, Tina here, Sandy was the baby, I put her in the middle. Donna carried three diaper bags. One Sunday night, we came home from church. I had the three children, I was out, I went up on the front porch, I had the key, I put it in the lock, and as I looked down, right in front of my feet was a coiled rattlesnake. And I took a real deep breath and I want to say this. Sometimes when I get excited, I talk loud. <laughs> and right at that moment, as I'm looking down, I said, Donna, get over here. And I'm going to tell you, she came flying out of that car like lightning. She said, don't you talk to me that way. <laughs> I said, there's a rattlesnake at my feet. She said, that's a likely story. She walked up on the porch and screamed. She said, there's a snake. I said, as I was saying, <laughs> take the children. So I handed her the three children. She put them in the car. I said, get the bar out of the weightlifting set I've got in there. Obviously, I haven't used that for a long, long time. <laughs> get that metal bar. I'm, I got to kill this snake. I got that bar. Oh, popped it on the head. And the snake died, these enemies you shall see no more. <laughs> how do you see yourself? The point, the point I'm making is how you see the problem is the problem. She didn't really appreciate my situation until she saw it. How you see the problem is the problem. And you don't really see what they see until you take time to see it. But now the question is how do you see yourself? How do you see your future? How do you see your past? Do you see hope? Do you see a meaningless, monotonous future? The story is told of an American Indian who found an eagle's egg and put it in the nest of a prairie chicken. The eaglet hatched with a brood of prairie chickens and he grew up with them. All of his life, the eagle, thinking he was a prairie chicken, did what they did. He scratched in the dirt for seeds and for worms. He clucked and he cackled. When he dared to fly, it was only for a few feet because that's what the other prairie chickens were doing. And that's what he believed that's all he could do. 
Their limitations became his limitations. Years passed and one day he looked in the sky and saw a magnificent bird in the cloudless sky flying gracefully. And he said to the other prayer chickens, what is that? And they said, that is a mighty eagle. But don't ever think you could do that because you're a prayer chicken. Don't dare think you can do that. You can never be like them. So the deceived earthbound eagle never gave it another thought and died believing he was a prairie chicken. What he thought about himself was completely controlled by those who were around him and his potential for what he could be was never realized. What a waste. God designed him to fly into the highest heavens. He was engineered by the divine architect of the ages Yet he plucked for worms and scratched in the dirt, cackling and clucking because he believed he could do no better. You will do the same thing if you do not see yourself as God sees you. You are God's divine creation. There is within you a divine principle locked up waiting to explode, looking for the opportunity for you to reach the divine destiny that God has for you. You have been created a little lower than the angels. The royal blood of heaven is flowing in your veins, in your veins, in your veins, in your veins. You are kings and priests unto God. You are heirs and joint heirs in an eternal kingdom that's never going to pass away. God does not manufacture junk and he does not sponsor flops. Your future is far greater than anything you can possibly imagine. You are destined for high flight. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on the wings of eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Stop living, acting like a prairie chicken, clucking in the dust and the dirt. Take off for the heavens and fly on the wings of faith to the destiny that God has for you. Give the Lord praise in the house of God. The first three problems God forced Israel to face are the same three problems you must defeat to succeed. One is fear. At the Red Sea, Pharaoh with 600 chosen chariots of war and the world's mightiest army were thundering across the desert toward the children of Israel. Exodus 14, 10, the text, and they were sore afraid. Listen to what they said to Moses in Terah. I mean, you know, people say things when they're really afraid that really is just too much. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Didn't we tell you this was going to happen all the time? It would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to come out here in the desert and die. Remember how you see the problem is the problem. Moses could have taken that as a personal attack and said, all right, you think I'm chopped liver? Just sit right here. Those guys in the chariots are going to kill every blessed one of you. He saw the real problem. The real problem was fear. He gave them three commands. Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. The two words that Jesus used most in his ministry were those two. Fear not. Say it with me. Fear not. The Bible says, fear not death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Fear not disease. I am the Lord your God that heals all of your diseases. By his stripes, you are healed. He sent his word and he healed him. Fear not the past. It is forgiven. It is forgotten. It is buried in the deepest sea, never to be remembered against you anymore. Glory to the living God. Fear not your future. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I know who holds tomorrow. I can tell you prophetically what's about to happen. I just can't tell you when. 
In the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ are going to rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. The king is coming. The church triumphant is getting ready to leave planet Earth. Lift your heads and rejoice. What a day that will be. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Fear not your enemies. The Bible says, I will make your enemies to be at peace with you. The Lord is my light and my salvation, David writes. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? The Egyptians, your enemies, you see this day. You will see no more forever. God says, when I start solving your problems, I solve them completely. When I take out your enemies, I take them out completely. When I knock the barrier down, I knock it completely down. When Goliath gets hit with a rock, we take his head off. It is not a partial victory that we have in Jesus. The victory is total and complete. There was no partial victory at Calvary. When he conquered death, hell, and the grave, he totally conquered it. Therefore, we have eternal life and we shout for joy because the king has given unto us the total victory. Give the Lord praise in the house of God. The second problem God forced Israel to face was bitterness. God took them straight to the bitter water of Merah. Exodus 15:23. And when they came to mirror, they could not drink the water because it was very bitter. The question, how many of you in this room and those of you watching by television are standing in a bitter pool? You remember a bitter childhood. You remember a bitter divorce, a bitter business deal. Something that was filled with deception. You remember bitter conditions in your home that destroy your peace a bitter experience that you've had in the workplace. Here's the solution. Stop complaining to Moses and start talking to God. You know you are bitter when you know everything and you believe nothing. As soon as Moses prayed, God showed him the solutions. Solutions or seen when prayers are prayed. Until you pray, no problem is going to be solved. Stop blaming the circumstance, stop blaming conditions, stop blaming God and start talking to God. Stop blaming yourself. You're, stop acting like a prairie chicken, scratching around in the dirt. Conduct yourself as the eagle God destined for you to be and fly on the wings of faith into the face of God in the highest heaven. But here's the solution to this bitterness problem. And the Lord showed Moses a tree. Moses cut down the tree and it fell in the bitter pool and it was made sweet. End of quote. How? It was a supernatural act of God. That tree hit those bitter waters. It became sweet water. Here is the solution to your bitterness. Jesus Christ was taken to Calvary where he was nailed to a cursed tree. And when that tree fell into the bitter pool of your life, supernaturally and instantaneously, the bitterness disappears and life becomes sweet. We sing the song, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word." Bitterness is forgotten when Jesus comes into your heart. Harsh words are forgotten. The past is forgotten. You will have new joy. You will have a new song. You will have a new hope because you've gone to the cross and the cross has supernaturally removed the bitterness of the past. Now life is a blessed thing. We sing the song, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Quit dancing in your bitter pool and take it to the cross 
and let the cross bring to you a sweetness and a presence and a power that will change your life. The third problem Israel faced was the lack of self-control. As Christians, there are 16 areas that the Bible mandates we have self-control. No, I'm not going to teach those right now. We are to be self-controlled simply in every area of our life. On one occasion, a very irate church member, a woman, came to me and she said, I resent my life because I'm so out of control. I said, are you really? And she went through her litany. I said, let's look at really all the facts and just see how out of control you are. One, you control what you do with your free time. You have the ability to control your thoughts and your dreams that control your mood and shape your destiny. How many of you have ever had an angry thought go through your mind and you let it park there until you were as mad as a wet hen? Let me see your hand. God bless you, you're honest today. I'm going to tell you that's a 99% participation. Three, you also control your attitude for the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. If you think you can't, you can't. If you think you're not able, you're not. If you think you're a loser, you are. If you think victory is impossible, it is. As a man thinketh, as a woman thinketh, so so are you. You can also control your tongue. You may not want to control your tongue, but you have that ability. You can choose to remain silent. God forbid. (laughs) Or you can choose to speak. If you choose to speak, you can choose your words. And you can choose the tone of your voice. You can start a fight or you can enjoy the day of blessed hope just by what you say. You can choose your role models. You can follow Jesus Christ and the word of God and live in a dimension of love, joy, and peace. Or you can turn on the television and follow hell's legions down a sewer pipe to the gates of hell. That's your choice. God will let you do that. I looked at the church member and said, you've got a lot of control. You take charge of your life and stop letting circumstances control your life and other people's thoughts about you control your life. Stop being bound by the foolish opinions of other people. What does God think about you? If God loves you, if you're standing in the purity of the word of God, hold your head up, square your shoulders and keep on moving. Everything's gonna be all right. Give the Lord praise in the house. In this age of technology, we have learned to control everything but ourselves. It's easier for a man to control the universe than to control himself. We have controlled the sun so that it can heat our house. We have controlled mighty rivers to produce electricity for major cities. It's easier for us to control the outside than for us to control the inside. Our technology has produced nuclear bombs so powerful that it has been said we have the atomic energy to kill everyone in the world a dozen times. Experts state that we have enough atomic weapons absolutely to destroy human life forever. Iran is now working day and night to develop nuclear weapons. I want you to hear this. The Iran issue is not in the rear view mirror. They're going to use the money we gave them to build better weapons. And part of those weapons are going to be nuclear. And they will use them in a Middle East nuclear effort. You can bet on that. Iran is working for a nuclear holocaust. That's what they're after. I've got news for you. I am not afraid of a nuclear bomb. I'm afraid of it when it's in the hand of a man. Because history has proven that men cannot control themselves. History has also proven this fact, that in military warfare, there has never been a weapon invented that has not been used. So I can tell you without blinking, there is going to be a nuclear war in the Middle East. I don't believe the church will be here to see that. 
But I believe when the book of Revelation says that one third of the earth's population is going to die in a day, I believe that's an expression of nuclear warfare. There's no way that many people can die in a 24 hour period. Self control, do you have it? You better get it because without it, you're going to destroy yourself. Without it, America's going to destruct. Right now, America is on the road to bankruptcy because the people we have elected to represent us in Washington cannot stop spending. To those of you who are in Congress, stop spending our children and grandchildren into poverty. Balance the budget of the United States of America. The Bible says, he who conquers a city is not nearly as strong as the man who conquers himself. Your doubts are traitors to your dreams. Your fears strangle your hopes. Your habits are born of your free will. They lead you to captivity or to paradise. Your choices either keep you in the problem, sometimes for life, or they lead you to the provision of the promised land. Self-control is one of the Bible's most valuable lessons. David conquered Goliath. He killed the lion. He killed the bear. He fought 18 wars for Israel and won them all, but he couldn't conquer himself because of his lust for Bathsheba. It produced murder when he killed her husband, Uriah. God did not allow him to build the temple, which was his earthly dream, because he could not control himself. Alexander the Great conquered the world, and at the age of 33, died crying underneath a tree with syphilis, because there was no war to fight and no one to conquer. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the master at demonstrating self-control. In his crucifixion, he had all power in heaven and in earth. At any second, he could have called 10,000 angels from heaven to atomize the earth, to destroy every human being on the face of planet earth. But he looked at his final hour on this earth to teach us what self-control looks like. Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver, Peter cursed and denied him. Thomas doubted him, saying, I won't believe that he is the Messiah until I touch the scars in his hand. Pilate whipped Jesus with a Roman cat of nine tails with 39 stripes. Herod's men of war slapped him and spit upon him, mocking him and placed a crown of thorns upon him and ripped his flesh to the bone. They placed a robe upon him to compound his mockery. Roman hands drove nails through his hands and his feet. They lifted him into the air and dropped his cross into the bowels of the earth, ripping his flesh as the cross hit the rock. They hung Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, over his head. They laughed at him. They mocked him. They said he saved others, but he cannot save himself. It was true. He could have saved himself, but then he wouldn't have been able to save you. So he died. Listen, Jesus that had all power had the power to smash them. Yet he said with all tenderness in the last moment of his life, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is self-control. Do you have it? You better find it. It's one of the absolute essentials of getting out of your problem. Three steps in solving every problem. One, define the problem and take bold, aggressive action. When the chariots of Pharaoh came thundering across the wilderness, the children of Israel came and cried to Moses. Moses stepped up and cried to God. God spoke back to Moses. Translation, Hagee's International Version, get moving, Moses. Get moving. Quit listening to these people whine and get moving. If you've got a problem, stop dancing around in it. Cut through the fat and get to the other side of it. God will help you. God will show the answer. You know that it's not what happens to you that matters. It's your response to what happens. Do you have a problem? Solve it. Do you have enemies? 
Get up every morning with a smile on your face. It drives your enemies insane. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt made a statement years ago that I have recorded. It says, no one can hurt you without your consent. They cannot take away your self-respect if you do not hand it to them on a silver platter. That's profound. Christianity is a doing faith. Faith without works is dead. Christianity is putting on the whole armor of God and taking the devil on. It's not running in fear and trembling. Noah built an ark when the weatherman said on channel 12, it's never rained before. David walked toward Goliath as Goliath was clanking his sword on his shield while 40,000 soldiers laughed at what he was doing. Christianity is Jesus invading the temple with a rope and driving out the money changers. Message, do something about your problem. Take action. I had read the story of a farmer who bought a farm. He painted the house. He painted the barn. He built a new fence. He plowed the fields. He planted the fields. Now the harvest was coming. The red barn was shining in the sun. The white house looked resplendent. The farmer next door came over and said, look at that house and that barn that God has given you. And look at these rich fields. And the farmer said, yeah, you should have seen it when God had it by himself. Message, you take action and God can take action. And in closing, in solving your problem, never quit. They that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Listen to this true story about a mother who was trying to encourage her son's musical progress on the piano. How many of you have ever given your children eight years of piano and all they could play was chopsticks? <laughs> Getting a few hands here. This mother bought tickets to the Paderewski performance. Mr. Paderewski was a world-class pianist. When the mother and son went to the performance, they found their seats in the center of the concert hall. They eyed that majestic Steinway piano that sat right in the front of them. The mother saw someone come in that she knew and she went over and started talking to them. At that moment, her nine-year-old son bounded up on the stage, sat down on the piano stool and began to play chopsticks. The crowd booed. They were horrified. The mother was mortified. Paderewski heard the racket standing backstage. He walked out on the stage and he sat down beside the young boy that was doing his best playing chopsticks. And he said, son, whatever you're doing, don't stop, just keep going. And as that boy played that simple stop chopsticks, Paderewski sat down beside him and began to compose a concerto structured around this simple child's simple playing of a simple song. It was a magnificent presentation. The crowd caught was caught up in the drama of what was happening. They stood and began to applause because what they were hearing was simply masterful as the creator of music was making something happen that should be a disaster come across beautifully. So what's the point? Some days in life when you're doing your very best and it sounds like chopsticks, God, the master musician, sits down beside you and says, keep playing. I'm gonna make this thing a masterpiece. What you see is terrible. I'm gonna make it beautiful. This is gonna be the best thing we've ever done together. Just keep on going. It's going to be all right. Just keep on, don't quit. Keep trying. I can make your worst effort look like a beautiful thing. If God for you. Who can be against you? Give the Lord praise in the house of God. Can we stand? How many of you in this audience will say, Pastor, I have a prairie chicken outlook on life. I'm living beneath my potential. I'm scratching in the dirt, ignoring the divine destiny God has given me. If that describes you, let me see your hand. Moses said to Israel, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
How many of you here say, I'm facing a problem that has robbed me of my peace of mind? A problem that fills me with worry, with fear and anxiety. Does that describe you? Let me see your hand. God bless you. There's an area in my life that's bitter and I wanna bring it to the cross today and let the cross fall into the bitter pool of my soul and make my life sweeter than the honeycomb. If that describes you, can I see your hand? God bless you. Pray this prayer with me before we receive this communion. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me see myself. Let me see myself. As you see me. As you see me. Take the fear. Take the fear. The insecurity. The insecurity. Out of my life. Out of my life. And let me go boldly through the problem. And let me go boldly through To reach the, the provision. To reach the That God has for me. Take the bitterness out of my mind, out of my spirit. Let the spirit of forgiveness flood my heart and mind so that I can have the self-control that I must have to reach my divine assignment. In Jesus' name, I pray and receive these things. Amen. Amen. Raise your hand for the blessing. And now may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace. May you walk from this place to go straight through your problem. May you receive God's provision in your health, in your finances, in your business, in your emotions, in everything that prevents you from flying on the wings of faith into the face of God. Let your life be filled with the love, the joy, and the peace of the Holy Spirit through the self-control of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, receive this blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray and say, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise in the house of God. Bless His name. This telecast has been brought to you in its entirety by the faithful support of Salt Covenant Partners with this ministry. Thank you, partners, for your faithful support.